you know, say it's good to be here this morning, and we appreciate each one that's come this way, and uh, ask you to pray for us, and certainly invite your attention to the scriptures, uh, things that the Lord has laid upon our heart. We're going to look at uh, a couple of verses in the book of uh, Amos, in the 8th chapter, uh, verses 11 and 12, uh, for a short reading lesson based some thoughts on this morning. Amos uh, chapter 8, verse 11. It said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, and I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from north even to the east, and they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Now, that to me is a scary thought. Mm -hmm. That a person could live in a place where there was no word of God. Mm -hmm. You look around the world today, and there are barren lands. Mm -hmm. I mean barren. I'm talking the ground is chapped. Those same lands once had the word of God. I am thankful this morning that we sit here in our possession of the holy words of God. Yeah. A few years ago, I had a business and I had to order different things. Um, and I became acquainted pretty well uh, with the individual, lived off from here. And over time, we would talk about different things just on occasion here and there, about our lives, what we did outside of work. She knew that I was a preacher, and I knew where she was raised and what she was raised in. And one day there was something that was said uh, about a quote, something that people attribute to the Scriptures, but it's not in the Bible. And I said, well, that, that's not in the Bible. I said, it's not. I said, no, it's, it's not. And I said, well, you need to get your Bible out and, and read it. I've never had a Bible. I said, are you serious? I've never had a Bible. In fact, there was never one in my home. And they were religious people. But they did not have the Word of God. That scared me to death. I think of these, this issue of being a famine of hearing the Word and of the Word being prevalent to people, I, I think about that over in countries that worship idol gods. I never thought just a few hundred miles away that there would be somebody that had never heard the Word of God. I'm satisfied that we could go down the road and find people that have never heard the Word of God. Isn't that sad? What a travesty. What a, 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 a thought. What a fear it ought to bring about us that there are people that have never heard or never have possessed or opened or looked into the words of God. I'm going to tell you what. We are very blessed this morning. Amen. Son, we, we've got something. As I sit there at that ordination yesterday and I listened and in one part of that service they present the Bible, the Holy Word of God. And some things were made mention of that I, I feel necessary this morning to make mention of as well. Now I ain't going to read all of this that's here, but I knew I wouldn't remember it like I wanted to. This book here, this King... James Version. Yeah, right. Is very important. Amen. Not just a Bible, but a King James Version of the Bible. Yeah. I want to let these young people know that that is the one that I try to preach out of. This is what was preached out of to me. This is what was preached out of to them. And I'm going to tell you what I believe it to be what we need to hold on to. Amen. 
Now, we look and know that the original text was written in language, in the Hebrew language, and we'd have never been able to read it without being raised up and taught that language. And there were different attempts that were made to translate that into the English language there in the Church of England. But we find that as King James sat upon his throne, and he was a Protestant. Now, he protested the Catholic Church. Now, I'm not running down anything. I'm just telling you the history and what it was. Mm -hmm. That's what they were. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know this. We aren't Protestants. To protest something means you are coming out from that. And that's what they were. They had once been in the Catholic Church and they were protesting its positions and they were protesting its beliefs and organization and they come out from that to protest it. Thus the word Protestants. We're not Protestants. The Lord's Church was set up before any other religious organization ever thought about being set up. Therefore, we are not Protestants. There was a time I remember hearing uh, Brother J.D. Sanders mention this about a man that was going to go off to war and you could put down your religion uh, and mark it. And the only thing was uh, Protestant was the closest and the man wouldn't mark it. They said, you got to mark something. He said, but I'm not that. I'm a Baptist. And they let him write it in. I'm going to tell you what, that was a wise thing to do. And I want these children to know, and these young people to know, that that's what we are, is we're Baptists, coming from the baptism of John. What we identify by. But we look at, he had a desire, even in that time, and he had come out and for, uh, and I'll say this, and it was said yesterday, and very wisely put, God can use anybody for His purpose. He can use an unsaved person to bring about what He desires to be done. He can bring about anything. He can use someone that is not a member of the Lord's church to work about His purpose. And I believe that here with King James, I ain't saying He wasn't a saved man, but I know He wasn't a member of the Lord's church. But He used him to bring about something that we benefit from today. He decided he wanted a translation made from the original Hebrew and Greek to be printed. No marginal notes. I've I've looked here and what I printed off, the directions that he had, there were 15 rules that he gave them to go by. And in 1604... He appointed certain men and he asked for 54, but only 47 participated. And he split them up into three distinct groups and they gave, they took certain parts of the scriptures and they began to work and labor. And I believe that the Holy Spirit of God helped them to translate that as close as possible from the original text to the English language so that the majority of the world, the more populated part of the world, could read it. I find in what they wrote that they took upon this very seriously. They didn't in any way disparage the attempts made before them but only look to try to get it as close to what God intended it so that more people could read it and understand it. And in 1611, they presented this word that we now hold to the king. Now, its original intent was solely for the church of England. Original intent. That was his original intent. For it to be held by them and for them to be able to read it in the organized church setting. And I am thankful that it came about that this word which cannot be bound was made so that you and I can read it today. 
I don't want to go on and I want to say a few more things before we look more into the Scriptures. I'm thankful that I can read. Amen. It's a thing we take for granted. But I'm thankful that I can read. If you go back 50 years, there were people in the churches that could not read. I've heard a story of a man that was called to preach and he could not read. And his wife that had the ability to read read him the Holy Word of God and taught it to him. Showing him how to read. To be able to discern. And he committed it to memory so that he could preach the Word of God. I want to tell you today that if you read, you're blessed. You got the mind about you to learn. You're blessed. And we need to take that gift that God has given us and apply that to the Holy Word of God. There have been people that have been persecuted (coughs) who have been executed for owning, possessing the Word of God. That if they were caught in possession of any part of the Scriptures, that they were either thrown in jail or they were hanged. Don't y'all feel blessed this morning? Heard of preachers that committed the Bible to memory scriptures to go out and preach it. Because I can tell you what, they might can take it out of our hand, but what they put in our heart and in our the Lord helps us to retain in our mind, they can't take. And that's why they preached it. And they began to declare this word. To a lost and a dying world. And I'm going to tell you as the Scriptures say, uh, Paul said one time he was in bonds. He said, I can tell you what, the Word of God cannot be bound. Son, it is like a powerful force driven by the hand of God. This Word here is the Scriptures. And you bear with us. I don't hardly know her where to start and where to finish. We find these Scriptures to tell, uh, teach us that this word, and y'all bear with us, I got way too many things turned down. Nowhere to find them all. That this word is mighty and sharp than any two edged sword. It says here in Hebrews 3 and 12, 4 and 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is not the Spirit. The Scriptures teach us plainly, uh, and I believe I've mentioned this here before, but I believe it bears mentioning again. The Scriptures in Ephesians 6 uh, and uh, verse 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This right here is not the Spirit, but the Spirit of God takes this Word and yields it as a sword to cut into the heart of mankind. Cut into mine. Did it cut into yours? Ah, son, it pierced me. And this Scripture teaches me that it is powerful. The men that preach it have no power. The Word has power. That has power. I have none. I am but mortal man. I am but sinful in my nature. But the Word of God is powerful. To those that hear it, the Scriptures teach me, and y'all bear with us here just a little bit. Oh, some things that come to my mind. What did they say over here in the book of Romans? It says here in Romans 1 and 16, For I am not ashamed to declare of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I'm going to tell you what, this Word of God with the Spirit in it, it's powerful. Without the Spirit, it's a dead letter though. 
Right. Son, that's the reason we need to preach it in the power and demonstration of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. That's the reason it's important when the Word of God is being preached that the church is praying for that Word, that it'd have its lodging place, Amen. that it'd find that seed would go out and it'd stick into the heart of those that are lost, those that are saved, every last person, that the Word of God would have its effect. The Word of God. Yeah. It's though He has spoken it to us. It's right here. Yeah. Written down for us to be able to read and to understand quick and powerful. I'd heard the word all my life. <coughs> heard preachers preach. Boy, when I was a little nine year old boy and I was sitting over here, mm -hmm. the word of God got hold of me. Yeah. That power of it and that Holy Spirit using it to pierce me got a hold of me. You know why it's important to come to church? Because the Word of God can be read and preached from. Yeah, that's right. It can be expounded upon and with the Holy Spirit of God it can have an effect on lost sinners but not just to the lost sinners. It can have an effect on to the saved individual as well. That's right. That's right. Word of God quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. says here it divides asunder the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and listen to this, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Mm -hmm. I have attempted, and I'm not a good preacher, but I have attempted to bring forth a portion of God's Word before, preaching on different things, and people come up to me and say, who told you about what was going on in my family? Who let you know what we were dealing with? Both to the positive, kind of aggravated at me, and sometimes it was to the thank you. I can tell you, Kevin hardly knows anything. Usually it's history before I know anything going on in anybody's life. But I can tell you what, that Word of God, with God leading and directing the preacher to preach out of this book, His Word of God can make you feel like you're the only one in the building. Amen. He can make you feel like the preacher is preaching right to you. Yeah. Discerning your thoughts, condemning you, making you feel as though, how does He know? Making you feel exposed making you feel naked and exposed to everyone. And I can assure you, that's the power of God doing that. It's the power of God doing that. Wonder how many people have sit there uh, hearing the Word of God uh, throughout this country and have heard that and have sat there and they sat there in their seat in fear, knowing that that Word being preached was to them. I'm going to tell you what, you know why many don't want to come. They'll put on the, the effect that they're mad, that they're offended. I can assure you many times the reason they don't want to return to hear the Word of God is it convicts them. It disturbs them. It is having that effect upon them. And they don't want to feel that way. They want to run from it. It's the worst thing they could ever do. Run from the Word of God. This scripture here, you're talking about an amazing thing whether you look in the English language or you go back to the original and I refer on certain things, words, I'll refer to what does it mean in the original mm -hmm. as much as I can. Do you know how many people pin this down over different centuries, different time frames? This is not a man-made, man-come-up-with book. No. This is not something contrived by man. But the Scripture says in 2 Timothy 3 and 16, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Mm -hmm. It is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. Now that perfect there doesn't mean without sin, but it does mean mature and grown up in the Word of God. Thoroughly furnished to all good works. We find over here in 2 Peter uh, 1 and 21, it says, For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I can tell you these words were pinned down and they were written down by these holy men of God, these apostles, these that recorded not only the words directly of God, but the history in which we can read because the Holy Spirit of God guided it. That's the reason you can take from Genesis all the way through the New Testament and you can find no error in the fact that God saved everyone by grace through faith. Yes. Amen. It's the reason you can find no discrepancy in it. I once approached a man about his soul. And his first words to me were, well, how did they get saved with all them goats and blood? He didn't want to talk about his soul. He wanted to try to take God's Word and twist it and rest it to try to disprove the grace of God. By the help of the Lord, I told him that blood and bulls and goats never saved a soul. You know why I could say that? Because it's in this book. It's in this book right here. It tells us that it didn't. But it was pointing towards the coming of a Savior that would shed His blood. And in that blood we must trust. In that man that shed it. These Scriptures here inspired. Now I don't know how many of y'all read. Kevin's not a reader. I'm not a good reader. I've made it known to y'all and anybody else I've ever stood in front of. One of the scariest things... I have to do is read out loud. I have a hard time reading. I always have. It takes me longer to understand things that some people can pick up just so quickly. I remember how hard that was on me as a kid. Even in school. So if you're here and you say, I can't, I'm going to tell you what, by the help of the Lord, you can't. You can read this inspired Word of God. I don't read novels. I probably started a gazillion, and I ain't finished but one or two. I finished Where the Red Pearl Grows in the eighth grade. I remember that. Like that book is about coon dogs. But outside of that, son, I didn't read any more than I had to read at school. Still don't today. Ain't nothing against reading. I'm not against any of that. But I'm going to tell you what, some of it ought to be put down. And this right here ought to be picked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These words are profitable for life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Scripture's here. You bear with us just a little while. My, my thoughts are really scattered here. I guess y'all should be used to that by now. These words here can help you. They can help clean you up. Get you in a better condition. Going along with that verse over there in 2 Timothy in Psalms 119 and 9, it says, Wherewithal shall a young man clean, cleanse his way? Now, I don't believe this is talking about saving himself. Just saving himself. The Scriptures, a lot of people think, uh, if I could just study them, then I can be saved by studying, by knowing them, by practicing them. And that's not true. We can't do it. The Lord said, search the Scriptures, they testify of Me. This whole book, this entire Bible, hinges on Jesus Christ. It hinges on His death, burial, and resurrection. It hinges on His love towards humanity. It hinges on all that. I can assure you, your love and dedication to live up to the standard while being commendable will not save your soul. But this Word of God right here to the saved person can do some good. Wherewith can a young man cleanse his way? You mean that saved people get dirty? Yes, sir, we do. The inward man's what gets saved. The outward man, we're still sinful. Still sinful in our nature. So it means our outward man can still get dirty and still need to be cleansed up. And yes, we have prayer, repentance unto God. By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. Sanctifying ourselves, cleansing ourselves by the reading of and the studying of 
and the practicing of the Holy Word of God. We need to do that. This is not just the preacher's responsibility. No. This is not just on, on any preacher. You can't lay all the weight, the burden of studying this Word in a, a, on the preacher. If you do that, and you don't know for yourself, how are you going to know when he ain't saying the right time? That's right, right. You need to be able to study for yourself. But we look here and it says that this Word of God, now everybody wants, a, everybody wants to hear about salvation and shout, let's go to heaven and let's all have a big time and it's all going to be wonderful, we're going to see all our family again. We, we want those sermons and I like them too. But you know what this Word of God is? It says it's profitable. <laughs> this right here is profitable. Yeah. People today, and I don't like nobody, Matt, trying to make a living, we... Try to invest our time and our money and our effort into things that will reap us back a profit. More than what we invest into it, we'll get in return. Well, this Word of God right here, son, you will get more out of it than you ever put into it. Son, it'll bless your life. It'll help. The Scriptures say that it is like a lamp unto your path. Now, we live in a world of darkness. It's a world of sin out here. The only light in this world is His church and His Word. It's the only light in it. So if we're going to be our path and not stumble as we go along, it only makes sense to get the light out. To be a part of the light, to be a part of the Lord's church, and not only to be a part of it, to join it, but to take this great light and shine it out in front of us. So we won't stumble. It says here it's profitable for doctrine. Doctrine is teaching. That's all that word means. I've heard preachers ridiculed for being doctrinal preachers. What they mean is, is they fuss on them a little bit. They preach on things that reprove them and they don't like that. So they want a revival preacher. They want them to preach on salvation all the time. Well, that's good, but you know what preaching on salvation is teaching? You can't open this book without teaching out of it. If you want me to read something that ain't going to teach you, then I'll bring in a book of poems next Sunday. And we'll read from that. Yeah. But if you want to learn, and you want to grow, son, this right here is what we've got to have. For reproof. Biggest whoopings I've ever took is sitting out here. Sitting out here listening to the preacher preach and know he's preaching to me. Or trying to preach one. And whooping myself with it. Trying to study on it. And whooping myself with it. This doctrine will reprove you. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and give you a warning. It will reprove you of sin. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to feel bad, you probably don't want to look at this book. And you don't want to listen to it preached on much. Because sooner or later, it'll point your sins out. Right. But it's there to help clean you up to get you to refrain from those things so that we're closer to God. This Word of God, it says, is for correction, for instruction in righteousness, teaching us how to live for the Lord. That the man of God, and I, it says man of God written in masculine sense, but it's not just to men, but to women, may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I mean ready to work. This Word of God will help prepare us to truly be able to serve Him. Mm -hmm. It will. Sometimes it work, and I, I joke, and, and I, I hope this is not disparaging to the Lord. I've got a, we've gone through a new system, and uh, they print us off instructions, and I've got a big binder. And, then, and I referred to it, and I said, now that's my work Bible. Y'all can't take it from me. Somebody tried to take it off, and, and I said, I won't know what to do if that ain't here. I have to refer to it all the time to know how to do my job. I can hand those same instructions to somebody else, and you know, just like a man when he's lost, they won't look at him. Won't look at a map, won't look to see what they ought to do. What's the instructions for? We'll just wing it. I'm going to tell you what, 
If we just try to wing our life, we're going to be in a mess. Amen. We got an instruction book here. Mm-hmm. You want to know how to raise your children? Look right in there. Yeah, that's right. You want to know how to get right with God? When you've done wrong, look right in there. You want to know how to be a good husband, a good wife? Look right in there. You want to know how to be a good son or a daughter? Look right in there. You want to know what to do with your finances? Look right in here. It's all right here. It is profitable for instruction. But if we don't want to read the instruction of God for our benefit, what's wrong with us? We want only the good parts of the book. Mm -hmm. We won't take it all. But I'm going to tell you what, this Word of God is here to benefit us if we'll take it. I'll bear with us just a little bit more and I'll, I'll, I'll try, to, try to be done. Preaching of this Word. Declaring of it. Our Lord died for it. Made it all true. Every bit of prophecy. But there have been men who have preached this gospel and for it, they've been put in jail in this country. The Lord permitted me to go up in Virginia, up around the Fredericksburg area. Washington, D.C. area. You get up in there and there's a rich Baptist heritage up in there. Mm-hmm. I've read books of men that were charged in this country before it was a separate country, just colonies, for preaching the gospel without having a license from the Church of England. Think about that for a minute. Mm-hmm. Ain't y'all glad to live in this country? We ain't got to ask nobody, no government, if we can preach this gospel. We can go out and preach it. There was a man on trial for preaching the Word of God. And he stood as his jury was over there for a judge and He made a statement somewhat to this nature that while I walked in sin, you took no notice of me. But now that I declare the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, you see me. There was a man in that jury who was a drinker and a swearer and a pair on. And that man's unflinching Faith in God and His Word in declaring it convicted that man's soul. Mm -hmm. Let him see that he was just a sinner in God's sight and he began to go to little meetings where Baptist people were meeting together and having service. And being heavily convicted of a service, leaving out the door, going out into the woods, I've read his testimony that he fell down. And he began to call on God and ask God to save his soul. That man went on and God called him to preach. His name was John Waller. And he too was persecuted for the very crime of preaching without a license from the church of England. He began to declare that truth and men just like him and they would put them down in prison. Back then, those prisons, they'd be in the basement. And they'd have them bars. And when they would see people coming to town and see their feet going, they would begin preaching. And one would get done and the other would take up. And he would preach. And the other would be done and they'd preach. And when the people quit walking by, they'd, they'd hush. They got tired of that. They knew how they knew, so they built a wall in front of those windows. They preached all the time. John Adams, leader in this country, as a little boy, saw a man in a cage in the middle of town for preaching the Word of God. And as a little boy, it is written recorded that he said, I thought, 
Surely God would not be pleased with this. When they were framing the Constitution of the United States of America, there were Baptist people who rose up and said, we will not support certain things and we're going to run a certain man. And they knew they had the votes. They said, we want the freedom to preach the Word of God. And they met. And they put that in the Bill of Rights. Glory be to God. And I can stand here today and hold this book Amen. in front of you all for the freedom we have was bought and paid for most of all by our Lord and Savior, but by men and women who would not deny this Word of God. Who held on to it like a valuable possession. One in which they uh, adored and revered. It was more than a family Bible in which records were keep. This is something they knew would be the salvation of their children if it was preached to them. Ain't y'all thankful this morning? Yeah, amen. Some we've got Bibles and some to spare. Look at them just stacked up over there. Stacked up when there's people in this world today that still don't have this blessed Word. Don't have this blessed Word preached to them. Thank You, Lord, that we have the ability to read it, the freedom to have it in our life. What a blessing. I pray that God will richly bless us and will help light a fire in our soul that we'll take this Word and we will read it. Now I'm going to give you a little advice, you young people. And I'll be done here in a minute. I wouldn't read over in Revelation starting out. I'd jump in that book of Psalms and I'd read Proverbs and then I'd read the four Gospels, if I was you. You talking about rich words, things that you can read and understand and live by. I'm going to tell you what, Psalms and Proverbs is good for you. It will teach you things. And then you read reading those Gospels and you'll get a better appreciation for the Lord saving your soul. I encourage you to read it. I encourage you to set aside time throughout your day, whether it be the first thing in the morning or the last thing at night, whatever it might be, take time to open this book. You know, there's a song that they sing, Dust on the Bible. Son, we need to dust her off and we need to read her. Been a great price paid for for us to be able to have her. This blessed Word. Why we look at the preacher and we why they need to stand. Well, I'm going to tell you what, the church is who the gospel was given to. Yeah. To deliver to this lost and dying world. Amen. The church has got the responsibility of making sure that it's preached in its purity. The church has got the responsibility of making sure that it's handed down. Yes, sir, here is the ordained means that God has called men to preach this truth. But it is only by the authority of the church that that happens. I ain't got no authority. I ain't got a lick. None. Every bit of what I have is owned by the Lord and His church. Son, I'm just an instrument. All I am, just an instrument in God's hand. Thankful this morning. Thankful that I have it. Shame that I haven't taken the time to study it like I should. But we can do better, can't we? We can do better. We can and we should. If you're here and lost, I would encourage you to seek the Lord today. Say, well, this ain't for the lost. Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir, this book tells them they're going to have to trust in God with all their heart. <laughs> with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, calling upon God. That's what the Holy Word says. Every testimony I read in there, I can recognize because it makes a connection with me <laughs> and what I went through. I would tell you, younger, you just keep encouraging your friends. You keep telling your friends. You keep witnessing to your friends. 
There is power in God. Power in His Word. Son, He can make it to have effect. While we stand and sing.